On the final word today, we have former England international, but these days, international commentator with Sky Sports and Talk Sport. More recently in Sri Lanka and in India on the freelance beat, uh, doing television on India's away tours. Uh, Mark Butcher, thanks for coming and having a chat. No problem. No problem. It's very nice to be uh, nice to be here. Well, it's nice to be anywhere at the moment, I guess. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I suppose we're doing the Zoom thing, which is the, which we should note off the top. Of course, we, we can't be in the same room as uh, one another, but we'll, we'll do the best we can with those uh, limitations. Of course, they're, they're, these limitations we've become all too familiar with. And mentioned you've been in Asia over the last few months. Um, mm. That was a big call, really, wasn't it? Leaving family and friends and going away to be... Um, not only in bubbles with the teams, I suppose, and the commentary teams in Sri Lanka and India, but um, also having to go through a number of quarantine bubbles and all the rest either side of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had a, a, a little sort of taster of it doing... I was in Pakistan before to finish off their P, PSL, which is obviously now that they've uh, they've lost the second one or the which what number six they're on at the moment. Yeah. That one's just been... Uh, just been halted halfway through um, and so I was in that position uh, back in March in 2020 while I was out there doing the the comp and it got uh, it got called off on about the 12th of March I think mm-hmm. and then and then so eventually went back and did the finals the playoffs um, in October of last year um, and so yeah I mean look I, I, I was relatively sanguine about the whole thing I mean you know there's no one on the planes there's no nobody's traveling you kind of you're almost safer zipping around the place to go and work than you are, you know, getting on the tube to go to, to go into London. So I, I, there was no problem with that. I mean, the quarantine side of things was a, was a bit of a, was, was great for five or six days <laughs> in Sri Lanka. I had a beautiful balcony and I was looking out over the, over the beach and over the water, um, writing a few songs and reading and, and generally not being bothered by people, which was tremendous. Um, but after five days, I wouldn't recommend much more than that. It starts to start to lose your mind a little bit. But uh, but there you go. That's that's where we are at the moment. Yeah, I'm not volunteering myself for 15 nights in hotel quarantine in Perth again um, anytime <laughs> soon. Hopefully, the next time that I'm I'm back over there, it's in slightly different uh, circumstances. Uh, watching you call over the last few weeks on television, especially, uh, uh, it reminded me of something that Ian Smith said to us during the Calling the Shots documentary last year about the fact that he, he's an overnight sensation who's just happened to be doing this for 30 years, and it seems a little bit. <laughs> Of that around you at the moment it's not as though you're new to television broadcasting you've been in the caper uh, since you retired from well since you stopped playing um, uh, domestic cricket back in 2009 and had a lot of experience yeah. before that but it feels like it has been somewhat of a, a watershed moment for you calling these tests in Asia is that how it's been experienced by you as well that you in a way you've, you've almost taken a next step this winter yeah it, it, it sort of occurred to me that your exact words really the sort of the, the 15 year overnight sensation thing <laughs> Um, but I, but I'm very very grateful to have had the had the fly hours behind me really. Um, you know it's been great to do test matches. I've I've done I've done as much T20 and uh, and you know domestic 50 over cricket and various other things. Um, and it's all been fabulous experience. But um, you know hardly done any test match cricket. And of course that was the only thing I played quite famously. Yeah. Um, and so it's just really nice to be able to get the chance to. You know the way that test matches move there are there are just so many more talking points there are so many more nuances there are so many more sort of periods of periods where it's quiet periods where it's up you know you have to you have to go through the full range of um the full range of, of emotion with it as opposed to t20 when you're kind of like shrieking like a banshee from start to finish you know um and so it was just really nice and lovely to get the opportunity to do it i mean it only came up because of covid you know on the one hand it's been bloody miserable but on the other hand it's it's meant that i was in sri lanka when um you know when the, the they were looking for people to come and commentate from from the england point of view and if i hadn't have been in sri lanka i probably wouldn't have got the gig um you know there was massive difficulties in getting people you know they would have preferred nasa and athers and, and the guys from sky to come over and and do their thing but there was you know the, the, the quarantine periods coming from the uk were 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 14 days and costs and everything, just everything about it was a nightmare. Mm. So the fact that I was in, uh, you know, in Gaul and uh, notionally a 45 minute plane journey away, although I did have to go all the way back to Abu Dhabi to come back. Um, but that's another story <laughs> uh, meant that I got, you know, I, I got the gig. So it was so great fun. Um, and, you know, very grateful. Like, as I said, very grateful to have had a, um, an enormous amount and it is an enormous amount of experience doing all various types of things you know whether it be presenting whether it be 
um, sort of roving reporter style stuff that Sky put me on um, for the IPLs back in the day. Um, you know, basic commentary, lead commentary, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Mm, I've kind mm. of been there and, and had had the chance to build all of that into my CV. So it just, you know, I was able to just go in there and enjoy it. And it was a lot of fun. Mark, we've known for a long while that commentators working for the BCCI uh, have things they're not supposed to talk about and not allowed to and so <laughs> on. It seemed like a lot of the response to you, the, the, the positive response and enthusiasm for you was that you were um, willing to say things that might not be entirely company sanctioned or all the rest of it. But it also seems faintly ridiculous that that was seen to be exceptional because it's not like what you were saying was anything um hugely critical or, or no. um, vicious or egregious so it was it was very politely and good humoredly stepping slightly out of line yeah well i mean listen the, the, uh, nobody spoke to me before during or after any of the test matches to say okay we'd prefer it if you didn't go here or we'd prefer it if you were um, you know, uncritical of, of everything that you're watching. That that didn't happen. So, you know, let's, let's put that to bed um, straight away. Um, and, you know, I, I understand that there, there can be various pressures brought to bear on on, uh, on, on the guys from the home team, but I, don't, I didn't realise that that was happening. I, did, I had no inkling that that was the case. Um, and, and as you say, you know, if... If, if people were kind of noticing the fact that there might have been a little bit of disagreement or niggle in the commentary box, that's what that's what you that's what the viewers at home love. And I think the only the only real um, philosophy, if there is one, um, from my point of view, when it comes to, to to calling games and stuff, is that you know put yourself in the put yourself on the sofa at home. You know, imagine what what would you like to be listening to? How how would you you know how would you want to be? Um, want to be entertained by what you're seeing um and so you know I, I try to avoid coaching where i can unless something extraordinary has happened that because if you know if you're talking to an audience that sat down to watch a test match for seven or eight days they're gonna they're gonna know more about it than than perhaps is given credit to them for um and other than that just just tell them what's happening just call just call what's in front of you you know <laughs> yeah, and there's and there's some similarities there, I suppose, to uh, what Nasser Hussain said to us last year when mm. having having this conversation with him. That mm. um, from his perspective, it's about uh, keeping the, the the viewer entertained and informed, and sort of mm. leaving all the other baggage at the door, and, and treating this not like just something that he happened to step into after playing cricket and trading off yeah. his name as a former international, but uh, becoming a, an authentic and true and legitimate broadcaster. And, and that's a similar journey that you've been on, which equips you to speak with authority when, when the time asks for it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it, it, it does the, the game. It does, it does broadcasting a massive disservice to kind of not, not take it as its own job. You know, as its own skill and its own set of um, uh, um, you know rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very aware of the fact that as a as a former player, um, I have I would have been afforded um, more opportunities to you know to have a microphone and to, to to call live games than than guys who have been working in radio and television all their lives. You know, um, and so there's a responsibility there. Um, I think to to take the broadcasting side of it very seriously, and and as you say, not just fall back on the fact that you that you played once uh, many moons ago, and that that is enough. You know, there are there are there are skills and, and things that are that are as far away removed from being a former player as there could possibly be, and mm, you have to mm. treat the treat the job like that. Um, and so, you know, hopefully, hopefully. Um, I stay I stay true to that. I mean, it's, it can be difficult sometimes, especially when you're sat in a commentary box, which is full of people who used to do your job. You know, you kind of you, the, the, <laughs> the, the the temptation to kind of fall into a into a dressing room style kind of way of of, of, of bantering um, is it can be can be difficult to resist. But again, you know, hopefully, I mean, the, see the other the other side to it is this: is that the job is not you're not there to cheerlead for one side or the other. That's that's the other side of it. You, you're as critical of, of England as you are Australia, as you are of India, as you are of anybody else. And as long as you can do that and you can call out shithousery from your side as much as you can from the other side, then you're then you're then you're halfway there. Um, and then the rest of it is just trying to be yourself as much as you possibly can. And with me, that you know that involves not not seeing it as it's not life or death. It's a game, and hopefully it's fun. <laughs> although you know there were times during the last series where it wasn't a lot of fun for for our boys but um 
you know, that's that that that's it. Is in terms of hitting that quality mark, is is that something that it has to be self driven, or you know, might be if you and a handful of other colleagues who do that because we, you know, so much of the time you've mentioned this before as well there's no training really given to former player mm. broadcasters it's just you've retired you're famous here's a microphone off you shoot um and and there's very little criticism um given by you know directors on a lot of the programs do, do you yeah. did you have to decide that you wanted to be as good as you could possibly be well, well i'll put it this way but sky sky in the uk as i said i'm sort of really thankful to them for having given me an opportunity to do this going back as far as sort of 1999 Mm. you know sitting in live studios and things like that um and the thing that the thing that you learn or the thing that you were wise to kind of keep an eye out for was the fact that you wouldn't get invited back if you weren't if, if you weren't kind of showing that you had a, a, an interest in it beyond picking up the check um and so then it then it became you know sort of having conversations with presenters more senior people the guys in the you know the guys working vt the guys the directors trying to kind of get some sort of an idea of what the of what television is like you know right. the, the fact that you know cricket is is taken as red that's why they've asked you but hmm. tv in itself and making television and who who does what and who's who, what you know the lighting guys the floor manager all, all these types of things you know trying to have some sort of an interest in the production as a whole um and that you know i, I don't think i understood that until quite a bit later on i kind of had managed to survive getting the old gig here and there but then you kind of realize if i want to do this if i want them to kind of to to, to hire me on a more regular basis i've kind of got to got to step up step mm. my game up a little bit and being a, and just being a former player just isn't enough um and so yeah it is self-driven to to a certain extent um and you know necessity driven driven as well you know mother of invention and all that kind of stuff um, not having not having a tremendous amount of skill outside of the game of cricket, and <laughs> having decided that having decided that I I wasn't going to you know I didn't really fancy being in dressing rooms for the rest of my life, having spent nearly all of it in them up until that point. Um, you know you had to you've got to kind of go and get your head down and, and treat it as a skill that is there to be learned and to try and to try and be as good as it as you possibly can as as I try to do when I play. Well, let's go back to dressing rooms and your earliest days in them uh, and we'll swing through your, your life in cricket and perhaps return to broadcasting <clears> a little bit later because I mean your life was in a dressing room there at the Oval your dad of course being a champion of the club through the 70s and 80s and having played mm. test cricket himself albeit once but still yeah. nevertheless an international player means something uh, on the county scene and uh, I mean you've described Surrey as having been in your blood fr from the outset so there was kind of little mm. surprise that you would go on to get a contract as a teenager and, and start playing the game that you loved. But give us a feel for what it was like being a little kid in the dressing room with all these heroes around you and your dad <laughs> being one of them. Yeah, well, I mean, it was just, just the, the best thing ever, you know, being surrounded by, by cricket kit, you know, brand new cricket kit and, um, you know, Whitener and stuff like that and having having people like Jeff Howarth and Sylvester Clark and people, you know, you call them uncle. My old man didn't drive when he was playing for Surrey, so he, you know, all the guys used to come and have to pick him up. So they'd all pop into the house and and say hi. So, you know, I, 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 it never occurred to me that I would do anything else, which is which is kind of handy, I suppose. Sort of blissful ignorance um, of the fact that stuff could go wrong because it just, you know, I, I was in the Surrey dressing room from the age of about three years. Why wouldn't I be there for the, you know, for the next thirty or something? So, um, I, there was a, it was a tremendous. It was a great time. It really, really was. Me and my brother used to, uh, we still have people come up to, to me now um, who were Surrey fans, you know, members or whatever back in the day when, when we used to, when we were kids, you used to be allowed to go out on the outfield and, and ping a tennis ball around. And we'd be sort of like using members as target practice in the pavilion, you know, but like pinging, uh, pinging drives into the, <laughs> into the pavilion at lunchtime at the close of play. I mean, that's what we did. You know, we're still, like I said, those, that, those of them that are still around will go, Oh, we remember you, you hit old Doris on the end with a, with a, <laughs> with a cover drive or something. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it just, just fantastic. And so, you know, all of that, all of that bled into the, into the idea that, um, you know, this is what I wanted to do. You know, I had, no, and, and as I said, I had no real plan B. Um, in fact, no, I had no plan B. It was, that was, that was what it was going to be. Um, and fortunately, um, I was, I was blessed enough, as was my brother with, with enough sort of, with enough 
ability to kind of to make that a reality mm. um and you know the difference between the difference between being sort of like the best at age under 12s under 13s in your school and in your year and all that kind of stuff is a world away from what then happens when you when you sign a professional contract and stuff you know so standing out at, at under 19 level or whatever as a, as a 16 17 year old was and then then you enter a completely different world when you're doing it for a, for a job and everybody else is trying to jump on your head as, as much as uh, as much as the opposition are um but yeah, like I said, it, it was a it, it was a it was a journey that 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 was mapped out as far as I was concerned. It didn't seem to be any other any other course to follow. Was there a kind of vertigo going up those levels? You know, because we hear a lot of people talk about this being, like you say, the best at your school or something, and you're monstering the competition in in that grade. But then as mm. soon as you go up to the next level, it's something else completely. Yeah, I mean, I, I was again, I kind of had always been challenged or sort of thrown in um younger or you know i was playing sort of first 11 club cricket in the surrey championship um sort of age 15 or something you know so i was always playing with people who were my elders and betters but i think one of the differences but so i signed contract with surrey at age 17 and i think we might have had sort of 28 29 maybe 30 professionals on the staff back then so when you come in as a as a, as a seventeen, a snotty nose seventeen year old with a bit of a you know cocky and a bit of a swagger, that that sort of thing you know nowadays is completely different. You know the, the, these these guys, eighteen year olds, are playing in the IPL in front of forty thousand people. Right. The the, the 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 way of things with seniority and and all the other sort of old time stuff that has has pretty much left the county game now. And I you know I can't speak for what happened in Australia and state cricket. But was that you kind of you had to wait your turn? You know? So you were literally you weren't you wouldn't bat in in preseason nets. You wouldn't do anything but sort of bowl, field, and and run around after the the senior pros. You probably wouldn't pick up a bat until you were sort of two or three weeks into the season starting. Um, so it, it was just a that's just the way it was. You know, I didn't I didn't make my first class debut for, I so I played two seasons two full seasons of sort of second eleven cricket before I, I maybe played a couple of. 40 over games but didn't make my first class debut until the very back end of 1992 so it was a couple of years before i got anywhere near the sort of first team mm. and, and probably quite rightly so too but but the the, the idea wasn't we signed these kids age 17 and we fast track them in it was we signed them age 17 and we and we kind of and we batter them and maybe you know one or two of them sort of get get through you know one or, one or two of them stick it out but most of them don't you know so you go got the patience yeah yeah, so you go on this like this trajectory of being, you know, second team, first team. Five years later, you, you, you're playing for England. You're in the Test team, which again, whether that was foretold or otherwise, you're there. Um, I found it interesting reading through um, interviews you've done in the past. Uh, there's a couple of competing threads here. There's the Mark Butcher, the bravado that you had as a kid coming through, uh, up against a, a, a sort of an imposter syndrome that you first felt as an international cricketer in that first chapter. Is that how you've been able to look at it going back, that you had quite a lot going on above the shoulders in terms of balancing out <laughs> this inherent cockiness that you had then uh, against yeah. sort of a sense of, gee, maybe I'm not quite yet at this level as a test opening batsman? Yeah, I think that, I think you only realise that once you once you play it, though. That was the right. thing. It kind of it, That happened. I only re had the realisation that, oh, my God, this is really tough, having been in it for, for a couple of, well, not quite a couple of years. But a few series yeah so um you know everything everything up until if you take out the sort of the early years of, of being the sort of the junior pro at the oval myself and adam Hollyoak signed at the, at the same time and we were the same we were the same character really i mean he's probably sort of you know slightly more slightly more flinty slightly tougher than i was but in terms of how our outlook and what we wanted to do and where we wanted to end, we both saw ourselves playing for england you know there was no mm -hmm. doubt that mm -hmm. that was that was the goal um so 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 from there to actually making that debut now on, on you know so made my debut against australia in an ashes series now i didn't really I, I have to tell you this i didn't really understand how much of a big deal the ashes was for right. some reason it was it was not a, it wasn't a conversation maybe it was because england had lost them for, for so many years on the bounce you know and it had been such a long time since you know 81 and, and beefy and the, and the 86 and 87 tour um, or whatever, but it kind of, you know, it, it strangely it escaped me just how how important 
that all of that was in the grand scheme of um, in, mm. in the grand scheme of cricket in, in the grand scheme of cricket, not just um, England in, as far as being an Englishman is concerned. And, I, and we we'd been on an A tour ninety six, um, which Adam Holyoke captained, and we all but the first game we lost to a New South Wales second eleven, I think, in one of our first matches, and then won every game from there on in. And a lot of the guys, you know, so myself, Ashley Giles, Michael Bourne, um, Adam Holyoke, Dean Headley, a lot of guys who, you know, who, who were making their making their way would eventually end up playing for England who were on that trip. Anthony McGrath. I mean, there's loads, loads of people. Um, and so, again, it was kind of like, well, this is easy, isn't it? You know, you're just going to, you'll get, you'll rock up and play, you'll get picked. And, and, and the, that trajectory will just continue the way that it always had. Um, but you know, after the first, so the first test, first test, Edgbaston, England win, mm. you know, and we're all on the front pages of the of the, the red tops and stuff. So again, no, oh, this is easy. Yeah. <laughs> this is brilliant. I didn't make any runs particularly, but it was kind of we just, you know, we just smashed them. Brilliant. Um, and then by the, so I, I think I get, nor or you know, not very many in the first innings at, at Lords, and McGrath took seven for or whatever. And you wake up, whatever it is, the next morning. Um, and you're out of the team, pretty much. You know, the the, the the news the scribes have had enough. They've sort of seen you and decided after three innings that you're not gonna you're not good enough. You're not gonna make it. So you're done. Hmm. Um, and the, so uh, so I get I think I get dropped on naught or something in the in the second innings. Mike Taylor of all people drops me at, at first slip. Relatively easy chance, but I swear to God, I swear to God, looking t- as I turned round. The ball righted itself. I think it was Paul Rifle bowling, about three meters away from him. It just the seam stood up and it just swung at him and it hit him on the wrist. I mean, Mark Taylor not laying a not laying a mitt on it. Um, and I made eighty something, you know, eighty seven, and, and saved the game. And so, you know, there you go. You've gone from being utterly useless two days beforehand to you know bravery and all this kind of crap in the papers the next day. And, th- and there it was. There was the roller coaster had begun. Um, and it and it never it didn't get any easier than that at all for, the, for particularly particularly in that period between making my debut in '97 and um, you know then then being left out of the team at the end of the South Africa tour '99 2000. Yeah, so these 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 high points and, and low points as you're mm. a young player in the Test team, you know, Test hundred in one of the most I suppose uh, fondly looked upon series in in modern memory against South Africa in '98 to mm. get yourself off the mark there at Leeds and. And Ashes 100 at Brisbane, which admittedly it was a a drawn match in the end, but the the very fact that you were able to start that series so well, you get those Mm. points, but and you become the England captain, albeit briefly too, in that terrible summer of 1999 against New Zealand when Nass is injured. But on the other side of it, I mean, um, you're battling. And again, you've you've talked in the past about how this was a, a constant struggle for you and um, you know, things weren't uh, going well for you off the field either. Um, it mm. was a, a volatile period of time. Um, yeah. Do you think with the sort of benefit of hindsight um, that there was a degree of, we wouldn't call it, we necessarily wouldn't necessarily call it it then, but you were experiencing a, a sort of a depressive period in your life whilst being an England player, that volatility sort of was the, the through line uh, in that period of 1999 especially? Yeah, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd made some made some pretty average decisions in my personal life of you know um which result you know resulted in in my having two beautiful daughters within within less than a year Mm. of each other um and you know i'd wrecked a marriage in the in the course of of doing that and various other things so there was all kinds of stuff going on off, off the field but i think one of the one of the defense mechanisms that i had built up was I, I I kind of believed that I knew what I was doing. I, you know, I had enough people sort of tell me at the over, oh, well, this kid really knows his game. He knows what he's up to. Blah 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 blah. And therefore, when um, when when things were going badly, I kind of didn't have anybody to turn to because I was supposed to know. I didn't have a, a you know, I didn't have a, sort of a mentor, if you like, who perhaps was was a little bit removed from everything else that's going on. You have coaches and all that kind of stuff, all fine. Um, who could kind of strip things back a little bit and kind of make me make me stop and have a little look around and readjust adjust what I was doing physically on the field and definitely adjust what I was doing off it. Um, that might well have made that all of those things better. Um, 
uh, and the bizarre thing is, is that that didn't really change. I mean, the, 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 my international career was in very much in two halves. But it didn't really change in the second half, except for the fact that that because I was out of the out, out of the game, that I, I I just asked my old man to help, and so we had three months. I had three months of having that mentor, and that three months got me three years of mm. reasonably successful. Um, in test cricket sort of from 2001 onwards that three months and again you know after, after that happened I don't think we ever we never really kind of went back into things in that sort of detail and I never really um, uh, got my headspace as clear as it had been in that time but it was enough um, you know I was able to to keep the keep the wolves at bay and play well enough and enjoy it enough for it to kind of go all, all right from that point on you mentioned getting credited with bravery after getting dropped it it's, relates to something that i'm always interested in with cricket which is the way that um we from a media perspective apply a sort of moral projection onto what players do on the field you know that that <clears throat> i i sort of have a theory that what happens in cricket is more about luck and good or bad fortune than you might want to admit you know you can prepare as well as you can but whether you get runs on a day or don't um can be down to fortune as much as anything else mm. but then we project something onto it someone makes runs and we say oh how, how brave they were someone doesn't make runs and they were weak or you know it was a, <laughs> a, a, a weak shot or a, a, a soft dismissal and all the rest of it um, mm. i'd be interested in your perspective on that well i mean it, i think the cricket sort of reveals character, doesn't it? I think that's 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 I think that's a given. It doesn't form your character; it reveals what your character is, and that's an important distinction. Um, and because because test matches in particular are, are played over such a long period of time, you know, if 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 I were a football player, and I'd had a terrible week at home, but I'd been out, I'd gone training, couple, you know, two or three hours a day up until Saturday. I reckon now you could get through Saturday. You know what I mean? Mm. The bus journey, the game, 90 minutes on the way back, and then you go back to life after that. You can kind of park it for that period of time. But if, if, if the walls are crumbling around you and you've got five days stretching out in front of you with potentially a three-day gap and then another five days, it's kind of you know that that time that time where your brain is kind of you know is being bombarded with various um either stimuluses or or the opposite of whatever the stimuluses are <laughs> beta blockers um the uh you know you it's very difficult to kind of to function um over at an at a high level at an elite level to use that awful word um over that period of time that you need to have some quiet the brain needs to be quiet enough to kind of do, to be able to do what it needs to do and if yeah. you if you're not in that if you're not in that headspace and your in your private life or your life outside of the game is a mess um it is I, I, some people can do it i know i know some people who have been able to do it but not very many do you think that might have a bit to do with the fact that uh for a lot of cricketers <laughs> that uh, in order to get that quiet they turn to other vices take booze for example again you've been pretty open about the fact that you drank yeah. pretty heavily through that um, stage of your career i mean mm. in the absence of being able to get clarity it's like well i'll get it another way i'll, I'll get it sort of at the bottom of a bottle or whatever it is to use the cliche yeah, get, yeah. get get quiet that way at least get your bromides that way. yeah yeah but it, but it's also i think also you know again that era of of cricket you know you you listen to the guys talking from the who played in the 70s and 80s, there is not a story that doesn't end or begin with beer or, you know, mm, being mm. in the bar or whatever else it was. I mean, that was kind of, that was just, that was it. You know, I right. I, I grew up with, you know, the, the, the old man and, and 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 those teams or whatever. They were very social. You had the pub right next to the Oval, <laughs> the, the Surrey Tavern. Me and my brother would be running around, climbing over the brick walls while the team would be in there having a drink with the opposition after every day's play. Um, it was just, you know, it was very much, you know, club cricket. Club cricket is entirely based around booze, isn't it? You know, the, the, the mm. bars being mm. open means that the clubs function. You get a jug for this, a jug for that. Um, you know, it was it's all very much part of the culture. Um, in terms of then, you know, in terms of then using it as a, as a way of, you know, I, hard, I, I found it very, very difficult to sleep. So, you, you know, you'd, you'd have a few drinks in order to try and make that easier. 
but that would uh, obviously as, as we all know that that's that's a very bad way to try and get proper sleep because you don't so then you think you need more and you know it, it just it, it perpetuates but I, but again you know talk about the sort of reputational type things i i had the had the ability in inverted, inverted commas to kind of not have very much sleep have a huge night out and then turn up the next day like nothing had happened you know and that became a sort of like a, a superpower you know mm-hmm. another one of those weird things where you um where where a, 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 a an objectively bad thing became something that people looked up to you for mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. <laughs> very very bizarre um but that, you know that that was the time that was that was that was how things were yeah um let's just to go back to that relationship with your dad did, did you get much of a chance when you were a kid to watch him play did you have that you know moments uh-uh. that stand out of, of seeing him sort of being able to be the hero on the field because that's this it's like seeing someone on stage when they're when they're on the field they they become somehow more than human in some sort of way but to to be watching that being your own father i imagine would be you know could be a very powerful experience or yeah or could, it could be, be but, I, but they were but again they were so but these guys were so they were so familiar to me that it, mm. it was that wasn't really the case i remember i remember meeting um i remember meeting larry gomes and and viv when uh, with the, uh, there was a, a it was either a tour game or a sort of charity game where the, the, the west indies team were over in maybe 84. i remember that that was the first time i thought whoa you yeah. know these these guys are you know something else um, and so, no, I mean, I didn't, I mean, and when I'd spend all that time at the Oval, but again, I'd be, there used to be a hard net or whatever at the, at the Vauxhall end. And we were allowed to go and use them because of, because dad was dad. Um, and so, you know, I'd very rarely see any cricket. I'd be, I'd be playing myself. Um, yeah. but I do remember getting nervous watching him on the, on the TV once or twice. Um, sort of, you know, hoping and praying that he'd, he'd make some runs, you know, but, uh, but beyond that, no, I, it was, it was not that. It wasn't that type of thing. I know. I know that I was very proud that he played, and I, I know that he, I was very proud that people had a lot of respect for him as a as, a, as an opening batsman and a player of fast bowling. So yeah. And, and I suppose that that time in the wilderness that you had after getting omitted from the side in ninety nine two thousand, and then mm. when you returned to it, you've talked about that sort of intense period working with your dad, who of course is a, an exceptional sort of highly regarded coach as well. It's not just yeah. a, a father son thing, but from a technical perspective, able to. Get, get you back on track from being a second team player remarkably at the start of 2001 mm. to being um, a hero at Headingley uh, later in, in that year. And again, yeah. you, you've talked in the past about how you found a way through in the in-between time to evaluate what cricket really was to you and uh, lose a little bit of baggage, which meant that by the time you, you, you were recalled and, and got that second sustained opportunity that you had that broader perspective. And, and maybe I wonder the extent to which that might have been uh, achieved from your father, given uh, you'd seen so much of him, but plays one test match um, and thus he sort of scaled that height. But uh, it didn't make him any less a person or cricketer or father because he hadn't played a hundred test matches. You know, there, there's, uh, there's no. a way there's a way of threading it together there, right? But I, I think so. Um, but but also, I mean, I'd never, I had never spent that sort of time with him before. Right. Never. I mean, you know, when when I was a kid and me and my brother Gary were kids we would see dad in the winters when he was coaching us football and PE at the school that he taught at in the off seasons. Um, and so we would see him and that he'd be a teacher then. Um, and then in the summers he'd be off playing. So there would, we didn't, uh, so the only time I'd ever spent that sort of time with him, uh, particularly around something is something that you would imagine that he'd have been in the garden throwing balls at me the whole time. It just wasn't the case. Right. So, um, so that the January, January to, to April time that we spent in 2001 was, was utterly unique in our relationship. Um, and it worked because I was at such a low ebb that I, I, I said to him, um, you know, do what you like. Treat me like I've never played the game before because I'm thinking about quitting because I'm having no, I'm, I'm hating it. And so but, but I want to I want to give it one one last shot. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I'm not I, you know I'm, I won't fight you. Just you know, do what you like. You treat me like I'm a, a, I'm, a I'm a piece of putty and, and do what you want. And he did. It was literally we went back to him teaching me how to pick the bat up properly, to hold like to grip the bat properly. He said he thought my grip had, had got had got 
too strong, hands too far around the back of the handle. Um, you know, I wasn't free enough in, in the way that I meant that I wasn't free enough in the way that I could swing my arms. So he taught me how to pick the bat up. I was, I played 27 test matches. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so where are we? 2001. So I'm what? How old? 29. Taught me how to stand, how to pick the bat up, how to grip it properly. All of these things. It went back as, it went back as far as that. Um, and I let him do it. You know, I can imagine in different circumstances, there's no way on earth that that would have happened. And I th he said that to me since he said that he wanted to make the call or he wanted to come and spend the time, but he just didn't didn't see how how I would take it. And I wouldn't have taken it well if he just sort of said to me in the middle of in the middle whilst I was still playing for him, oh, you know, I, I actually don't think you're doing this very well, <laughs> you know. Yeah fathers and sons and that that type of conversation they're not they're not renowned for that working out but but it worked out this time because i had no i had no sort of fight or ego with me left to 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 um to stop him so um and that's that's why it worked and did you have an awareness at the time that spending time with him like that was <clears throat> something special and you know something that I, hadn't happened I, before and wouldn't be replicated i looked forward to it immensely you know we i think I can't remember exactly, but it felt like we, we'd spent every day of every week for, for two and a half months together. It, was, it wasn't like that. It wasn't as, as much time as that, but it was kind of what it felt like. And I, I just, you know, it was like really being desperate to get to work every day. And we had a, you know, we had a really good time. Um, and, you know, there was, I don't know, I'd, I'd have to talk to him about it, um, but th there was something there was something in the relationship that had not been there before because of it. And, you know, and, and at the end, I, I remember, I remember vividly being told sort of after, so, you know, this is obviously the lead up to, to 2001 and the heading the innings was that, that he'd been in tears on the, the TMS had managed to get him on the phone at the end of the game. And that he was, <laughs> and that he was crying on the radio, you know? So, some it was yeah it was it was really special and it, it it never really happened again. I mean we had a pretty frosty, frosty old time of it as captain and coach at the at the Oval back at sort of back in <laughs> two thousand, where um where where conversations went back to being father and son you know, <laughs> stubborn and 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 cranky, so yeah I mean I think you know I'll look back forever on that has been has been an incredible time with him we often like talking to people on this show about their perfect day the one day when everything clicks and when the game was never better for them well you know chasing 315 on the final day that leads the ground where you, you know, made your first test time but three years on from mm. that an unbeaten 173 faultless flawless innings um where you're at your most fluent and all the rest of it i mean mm. I, I don't suppose you would have had a chance to have thought about your dad too much when you're in the middle but um after that obviously hearing his response on radio but um getting the chance to i suppose yeah. realize uh this had been uh, building uh, from the work mm. you've been doing with him and you're able to experience that not just for you but for him as well yeah, I mean, I, the, the one regret I have about that day is that I didn't mention it. Um, you know, the whole thing was just so bizarre. So post-match interviews, et cetera, et cetera. I, now, if you look at the way that the guys are when they do man of the match appearances or the captains are talking about, um, are talking about matches that they've won or lost and whatever, and how magnanimous everybody is and how much, you know, less self-absorbed self people are when they're talking generally, you know, not, not everyone, but generally. Um, and I, and that's the one regret I have about that day was that I didn't mention him by name or, or mention what we had done leading up to that in the, in the post-match stuff. But I was just, I didn't really understand what had happened to me mm, there. Mm. I mean, I know I, I knew that I'd been playing well in the series up until that point and felt like I owed, you know, I owed it to my, to, to myself and I owed it to the team to kind of make a bit more of, because it was a struggle, you know, we were getting battered as always. Um, to make more of the form that I was in. Um, and so, but, but to play like that um, against that bowling attack was, you know, was, was the sort of stuff that dreams are made of. And so I didn't, you know, it didn't occur to me that, that it had happened at, uh, directly. And there is no, no equivocation about it directly because of what we'd, what we'd done in those months. All of the things that we'd spoken about, all of the, the gifts that he'd sort of given me in terms of, 
freedom of uh, freedom of the the, hat, the bat swing, freedom of being able to access all different parts of the park, being more solid in defence, footwork. All of those things were direct a direct result of what we'd done. Um, so I bought him. A, I bought him a very expensive watch at the end of that summer to say, <laughs> <laughs> um, which he's. I think he's lost. Terrible with watches, my old man. But anyway, you know, it's just um, it's one of those things. It's one, one, again, it, I don't know how many people get the chance to, and, and, the, and the, the innings itself and the day, you know, been been there and spoken about it so often. It's kind of it bores me now. But hmm. the, um, the the chance to have had the chance to have done something. Um, and spent that time with 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 a family member, somebody that you've been that close to, and have it pay dividends to that degree. You know, I know people have sort of co- uh, coaching relationships, you have tennis players and whatever, or you have caddies and you know the the, the family members and all those types of things. <clears throat> but this was this was a little bit like a little bit like um, I'm guessing was where the tears came from. It was a little bit like uh, you know teaching you teaching your little boy to kind of, you know, to ride a bike and watching them, yeah. you know, watching them ride off into the distance, that type of thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'll be, I'm forever grateful for that. And there's something symbolic there with the watch uh, being gone about, you know, the time that you <clears throat> share together and that you don't get back once it's gone. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, like I said, I don't think, I don't think nothing has ever, is, is, we've never ever been that, that sort of tied in or close or, or whatever since then it was that that period and it was incredible and um you know now we, now we just take the mickey out of each other on whatsapp every day like like most, <laughs> like most people do and i suppose thus begins this second stanza <clears throat> of your your international career from the 2001 ashes onwards but it's kind of hard to get into that without the diversion at the end of uh, the 0102 tour when you're um, in New Zealand and you receive the utterly tragic news that Ben Holyoke um, passes away, of course, a teammate at Surrey and um, mm. someone, a family, you know, you've grown up with the Holyokes, as you said. Um, and that obviously is significant no matter how we frame this up, but the very fact that you picked up the guitar for the first time since you were a teenager, the guitar which you kind of put away, mm. as you've explained subsequently when um, you were signed by Surrey, uh, out it comes again to write a song of tribute to your friend and um it, yeah obviously there, there's there's a lot here but um that that must be a, a time in your life not just your cricketing life that you think back on with such strong memories yeah i mean the the trip itself i mean i imagine trying to play cricket after something like that happens yeah, yeah. um and we we, that happened. I, I I remember getting out in uh, Wellington. The test match was and walking back into the dressing room and finding that the dressing room was empty. Um, you know, sat there taking my pads off and the TV's on in the corner of the room. No sound on, and a ticker tape runs across the bottom of the screen to say that Ben Holyoke's been killed in a in a car accident in Perth. And I'm I'm sort of sitting there reading this, and there's no one else, no one else about, and I'm kind of thinking, where the hell is everyone? Mm. Do, do, do they know about this? So I kind of chucked my gear off and went, um, and found, you know, that everyone was sat in the in the viewing room at Wellington, there's a little viewing room out, <clears throat> looking at out on the game, and I burst into the room, and I think I can't remember whether it was Phil Neal, our team manager, kind of realised that something was up, and sort of he grabbed me and took me out of the room before I had the chance to to say anything and I said you know what's happened and he said yeah I said well what, what we do? what's going on do the, do the boys know I said, well, nobody knows yet we're in the middle of whatever the session was <sighs> and that you know so come I think maybe lunchtime or whatever it was again my timeline is a bit off on this I don't really mm. remember but it, they, everybody was then told and I just remember myself and Graham thought um out on the, you know, found found a stairwell and kind of got through half a packet of cigarettes and kind of just sat there bawling our eyes out. Mm. Um, and then we come back the next, you know, terrible night. We all, everyone goes out and has a drink and whatever. And turn up the next day and they do, you know, we all do a sort of a guard of honour stood out on the park before the before the day starts. The cameras kind of like right in your faces, mm. panning up and down, and we're all just we're just beside ourselves. Um, and we had to play the we had to play the game, um, and the you know the rest of the series I barely remember what happened. You know, um, so I shocker. 
I imagine at that point you could not give less of a shit about a cricket match. <laughs> exactly that, yeah. Exactly that. Um, and, you know, it was, you kind of, you tr you, you're there to do a job and the people are buying tickets to come watch you play and all that kind of stuff. I think we drew the series one or we probably should have won the game in Wellington, funnily enough. But, um, you know, didn't have the, didn't have the will really to kind of push it over the line and then got, got, uh, <laughs> got ambushed on one of those, um, those drop-in things at Auckland, I think, in the, in the last one and drew it one all. I'm interested. Um, and that was that. Yeah, I'm interested in, the, in that relationship <clears throat> between um, that tragedy, that terrible tragedy and that emotional release you got from picking up the guitar and, and investing in your music mm -hmm. and writing a song for his memorial service when you got back to the UK and how, yeah. how that all sort of ties together. Because, of course, your music's such a big part of your life and we haven't even really touched on it yet. Yeah, it's... um. Well, I mean, I, I always always took an acoustic guitar with me on, on tour. Right. Um, Stop the fingers going soft. <laughs> Um, and so I think we got taken up, a, up, up one of the, one of the famous hills there in, in Wellington. Um, and, and I, you know, I played, um, Marley's redemption song, I think, as we all sort of sat around and tried to make some sense of it, just, you know, bizarre type of thing. Um, but the, 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 the song for the, that I played at the memorial in, um, in Southwark, I wrote when I got back home, right. um, there was a bit more brain space um to to do that back then and the, and the, the wonderful thing about that was that we that I was able to i ended up in the recording studio we, we made a we made a, a, a recording of it and sold it to raise money for the ben Holyoke fund and then john and daria um adam and ben's mum and dad asked me if i'd play it for them at the, the big memorial service in southern cathedral which was one of the more terrifying things you will ever do um but yeah so i mean that was that and it you know Again, good stuff comes out of something terrible. Um, in that, I started to I started to sort of write, and 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 that that side of my <clears throat> that side of my life sort of took off again, um, with playing live and recording and various other things, and and that would end up leading to to my first album, which was sort of six seven years later. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> I don't know. It's, just, it's ridiculous, really. I, I wouldn't say that, that that it was directly responsible, but certainly in terms of being able to to meet up with um, various people from the music business, um, uh, recording artists and producers and things like that, um, it suddenly it sort of opened up one or two doors that perhaps wouldn't have, wouldn't have done otherwise, um, which is pretty horrendous really when you think about it. That that it. That, that, that it was something like that but it but what well, i mean that's the way that life goes isn't it yeah. you kind of you have um th th these tragedies or these 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 tremendous sort of high points and that you know that life then changes almost as a direct as a direct response to them doesn't it either either in terms of opportunity or in terms of something something not good happening that's just the way that it is and you're you're always sort of hostage to fortune in that way i think that's one of the most interesting things about about everything, isn't it? About 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 life is that you're never really sure. You never really know. You can have a plan and you can decide that this is what I want to do or this is how I want to spend my life. This is you know this is the way that I'm going to make my living, etc. But sometimes circumstances pop in and you know events get in the way, either for better or for worse. Yeah, there's there's the chain of cause and effect that you can predict um, and that you can anticipate and and put into place, but then there are the the causes and the effects that you can never anticipate. Mm. Indeed, indeed, and they're all they, they seem to they seem to make uh, make regular appearances in, uh, or at least they did through my through my twenties and thirties anyway. So and then, I guess something that that I reckon I've noticed as I've got older is that um, those big moments, you know, whether they're the, the great moments of grief or, or of triumph, they, they seem so long ago, but they're also so present, you know, they can mm. be, the, the years in between time can just disappear and you can be emotionally almost in exactly the same place um, when, when it comes back to you strongly. You can, you can. I mean, one, one of the things that I think that I've, that I've learned really um, is that, generally speaking that if you if you if you're open and available but also if you if you kind of if you realize or recognize that there is that there's work to be done or that there are 
you know, there are, um, it's not simply a case of just kind of the things landing in your lap, then you've got a pretty good chance of making them happen, you know. And like I said, you're always sort of going back to what we were saying in the beginning, that if, if, if sort of reputationally I hadn't, hadn't had people come chase after me to do the Sri Lanka trip on that one, then I wouldn't have been in the right place to have got the India trip. Yeah. Now, that's, that's fortune for sure, but it's also, you know, you, you have to give yourself, every once in a while, it's nice to give yourself a bit of, a bit of a pat on the back and say, well, you know, perhaps you, perhaps you deserve that this time. Um, whereas in the, you know, I think in the early, in the early days, things would just happen and I, and, and I wouldn't really have had a great deal of say or, <clears throat> or, or wouldn't have, wouldn't have sort of put processes in place to make them happen. They were kind of either happy coincidences or just, you know, right place, right time. But I think you can have you can have a little bit more you can have a little bit more of a say in the in the unknown things if if you're uh, if you're putting the work in and you're trying trying your very best to do to do the best you can um, it gives you more of a chance I think when you go through this stretch of playing consistent Test cricket for England thereafter so between the middle <clears> of two thousand and one and the end of two thousand and four where you play every Test you never dropped uh, you never injured mm. forty two uh, on the bounce which is quite an effort when you consider the way that English cricket was uh, well I suppose not so much in the in the early two thousands but the reputation mm. from the nineties which of course you later documented in that series you made for, for Sky Cricket. Um, but I'm interested in, in the way that <clears throat> you prepared yourself through that stretch. So you're more emotionally available perhaps than, than you had been before. You've been through quite a bit in your personal life, but um, as you've explained it um, in other interviews, you, you still managed to put up that, that wall around yourself, almost that protective shield, so that you could uh, have that sole focus of, of making runs and, and being productive for England. Yeah, I mean, look, again, again, I think, I think there's a certain amount of there's a certain amount of, of bluff involved in all of it because I'd, I'd made a promise to myself when I got selected again, I, when I was selected for that Ashes series in 2001, it was because five other blokes had fallen down injured before the series started. So I was under no illusions of the fact that I was, you know, that I was anywhere near first choice in the team. And because of that, because of that, I thought, well, this, this might not last for very long. It might, it might be, you know, I might play this series, yeah, you know, the, the heading the innings was great, et cetera, et cetera. But it could be a, that they go back to whatever their first choice might have been. If I if I have a couple of failures, then right, that <clears throat> that'll be that. And I and I was I was kind of happy. I was not happy with that, but I was kind of resigned to that fact, and I wasn't going to beat myself up about it because where I'd been, and um, you know, where, where I'd been, and where I, where I where I thought I might end up. Had, had been exceeded by being picked for England anyway. See what I mean? Mm. So I'd got, I basically just thought, so I'm going to enjoy this as much as I possibly can. I'm not going to get sort of bogged down in the in the sort of being, being um, you know, worrying about whether I'm going to get selected or not. I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm going to go out there and give everything as much of a crack as I possibly can. And that meant everything. On field, off field, the <laughs> whole lot. And I did. And that's what I did. Um, it, it, it caught up with me in the end, sort of around about. It caught up with me, uh, sort of around about two thousand and four. We had a, we won in the West Indies in two thousand and four, um, and I, you know, I contributed. I met, you know averaged fifty in the series and got battered by, by Tino and um, and Fidel on some on some pretty interesting decks, but made runs. hadn't played particularly well but made runs and contributed to us winning for the first time in 50 years or something so something to be proud of but I wasn't in great I wasn't in great nick and I wasn't in great shape by then I was kind of the, the, the toll was starting to be taken of, of just how much fun I was having um, so I picked up a bunch of injuries in the summer of 2004 had a rough old time of it against New Zealand I've never seen it be able to score any runs against New Zealand I, you know I don't know what that was all about, but it was just always a shit team for me. Couldn't couldn't get myself going at all. Um, and again, it was, it was another interaction I remember with with the old man was, you know, I was in a hotel room in, at Trent Bridge, and I called him up. I, I thought, well, I'll call him again, and I said, look, I'm I'm struggling here. I don't think I can do this anymore. And he put the phone down on me. <laughs> <laughs> he just went donk. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. And um, so, I, well, oh, okay, right. I'll stop feeling sorry for myself. I'm gonna, I, 
me and Thorpe, he put 150 or something in a run chase in the last innings of that test match and we won the game. I got 60 off. But anyway, even then I was still, I was just struggling. I wasn't, I wasn't right. And um, so, so, you know, I hadn't really learned a massive amount. I hadn't learned a huge amount from the, from the first time, I guess that's what I'm saying. Right. But so what, so but what I, but what I was able to do was I had, I had, I had some a technical proficiency that married up with the ability that I that I had was able to make me successful. Mm-hmm. Now I, I'm, I'm not, like I said to you before, I'm not big on numbers, but I do. But I had looked back because I was trying to so I was trying to work out. You know, you sort of sit there and you you're, you're commentating with Sonny Gavaska and Peterson and goodness, you know these these guys who have got incredible records in the game. And you, I'm sort of thinking to myself, well, you know, do I? How much how much credibility do I have standing up to these to these guys or getting in, involved in arguments about various stuff? And so I just thought, you know, I, I need to I need to kind of look into this because I knew that one heart one part of my career was better than the other. So I looked into it, and I, I averaged fifty at home between two thousand and one and two thousand and four, right, fifty something, and forty one overall in in that period. So I'd 20, 25 or something in the first first bit of my career prior to 2001 and 41 batting at three um for the next bit and i and i kind of i kind of i sort of pushed my chest out a little bit i thought oh well that's all right you know i didn't realize i didn't hadn't realized it was that good you know um you know there'll be there'll be australians watching this going oh fucking hell 41 jesus these pumps 41 you know, but anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean but i hadn't really i didn't really i hadn't realized that i'd kind of you know that i'd, I'd been as consistent as that yeah mm. Um, and so, you know, so, so, to be honest with you, given given the way that I was living my life and the way that everything else was going on, you know, what the old man did and the things that we changed back in two thousand and one lasted a very long time. I mean, had I had I been had I been a, a smarter guy, I think I'm reasonably smart now. But had I been a, re- a smarter guy when I was playing, it would have been it would have paid much bigger dividends than that. But like I was kind of playing on it. every every game felt like it or every series felt like, well, this this might be the last time, you know, mm. how much how much how much longer can I get away with this? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so and that's and that's that's what I did, you know. And so, again, you know, sort of regrets or whatever. I, I, I think I was I, I should have been a better, better player than I was or I should have been more productive than I was. But my but my life and the way that I was living it and, and just kind of kind of got in the way i was never i was never as focused on on it as i ought to have been and and i mm. freely admit that now if you'd have said that to me back then I'd have, I'd have told you to go and do one but i look back on it now and i think yeah especially when i, I spent a lot of spent a lot of time um broadcasting now around around the current players and about the, and the way that they the way that they go about things and the way that they live their lives i mean it's completely different to um to how things were back then and uh, and they kind of you know they, they they work unbelievably hard and they are very focused and they are you know they might not always be great but who is um but but it's very different now than it was then mm. it's interesting that you can still have imposter syndrome after playing 71 test matches be like, well, oh, you know, i wasn't <laughs> well, i wasn't that good i could have been much better well i mean no listen i was i was as good as i was as good as i could have been given given everything else but it, it didn't see it never felt and and this is a, this is a massive failing on my part. It never felt as though it was the most it, that it was a, that it was that serious. You know, I never really treated mm. it with the respect perhaps that it deserved. And who knows if I had done, I might have driven myself nuts and been worse. Yeah. But um, I might have been worse. I might have been, but who knows? The the way it um it it finishes up is like a lot of most sporting careers don't get a, a big farewell and a you know. A, a, a parade and all the rest of it and there's <laughs> there's sort of a metaphor for death i suppose in that it uh it well every time you get out you. there is every <laughs> time every time you every time yeah. you dismissed it's like a, it's like a little yeah. death isn't it although yeah. the french the, the french um, call a little death something else yes look not, it up not in not in quite a satisfying <laughs> way uh the different le, le petit more um can be quite distinct but the that when when a sporting career stops for one person it keeps going for everybody else um and and that's kind of you know that's how it was for you 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 had an injury you had a bungled operation and and then it was just this sort of mid-series overseas in south africa all right you're off home see you later um 
no fanfare and that's it yeah pretty much pretty much um i always remember simon jones coming down to see me off at the at the at the hotel um i'll never forget that jones is a great man i mean you know we obviously had a, a similar thing happen with him when yeah at brisbane where we thought we might never see him again and i think he remembered that and he came and saw me off at the at the, at the, at the not at the airport but at the hotel hmm. um and that was you know that was it i, I was done um and, and maybe i think i wonder if maybe in my in my mind i knew that um there was an ashes hmm. series coming up 2005 i didn't you know i had to have a the operation didn't happen in the end until sort of the middle of February, or February the 13th, just before Valentine's Day. Um, and I didn't recover from it until late August. And even then I had to have it done again. So I kind of, I, I maybe I knew when I left South Africa, I don't know. Maybe I kind of had an inkling that this was going to, this was going to take um, more than I had in me at the time to kind of, to, to, to come back from. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, so, so then you watch you watch that series two thousand and five most of it as a, as a fan. I watched wasn't playing myself. It was my benefit year actually at the Oval, so I was kind of doing events and trying to make a few quid for the for retirement, you know. Yeah. Um, and and I remember just just watching the and just being spellbound as everybody else was by this incredible series. Um, and then and then the sort of the realization. Um, the uh, the Trafalgar Square day was kind of like oh my god, Christ, I, 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 that should have been me. I should have been there, you know. Well, you foreshadowed um, it. You foreshadowed it in two thousand and three. I'll, I'll read a, I'll read a quote to you from two thousand and three when you kind of you know what? in the middle of the team. We sat down together and thought, imagine how big the bunch of players who win the Ashes will be. The country is so hungry for it. You wouldn't have to do anything for the rest of your life. It'll be just like the boys of nineteen sixty six. Is that what I said? You said that you thought. I mean, you essentially uh, foreshadowed what it would be like in 2005 for that group of players. Um, yeah. You know, the 1966 comparison is right there in in the Trafalgar Square. Um, you know, open top bus and and the way that team's uh, deified. I mean, really, even even to this day, isn't it? If you're a member of the 05 yeah. squad, even a bit player, and you sort of, I mean, you know, this mirrors a, a part of the chat we had with Nass, I suppose, in a way that. You and he were part of the teams that laid the foundation for that success in 2005, yet you weren't able to be there. Now, Nass was fairly um, uh, fairly phlegmatic about the whole thing, saying that his career ended when it did and that was cool. But you being a fraction younger and you having been there just before, I mean, it must, yeah. it must be tough knowing that you were kind of within touching distance of being part of that team, having been part of another type of team that's remembered in a slightly different way. Yeah. Yeah, but again, and I can remember the exact moment that that dawned on me as well. I was, I was in a dressing room at, at Edgbaston playing or trying to play in a, in a four-day game um, up there when, when that whole thing was happening. And I remember watching it on the TV and I had to get myself out of the room because I started to well up because that was what that was the moment that I, re I, I realised, crap, you know, missed out on, on that. Um it's interesting that I'd said that before. Yeah, I'm not as not as daft as I look, am I? But there we go. There's the, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. So it, it. But but during the during the series itself, it was kind of like it was just so gripping. It never really occurred to me to think about it from that point of view. But when it was over, mm. yeah. Uh, but you know, who knows? If I'd played, we probably would have lost. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, things, it would have gone differently. You might have won more convincingly, and and then it wouldn't have been as exciting, and wouldn't have been as memorable. So, well, exactly. you know, th that's, th it had to be a close result. That's that's your story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, there we go. Um, but, but, you know, maybe someone like Simon Jones, who did play in that series but never played again. Um, you know, he's he's probably someone who who got burnt by cricket as well he's not someone who's getting paid big money to you know lead the commentary on different channels and and all the rest of it he's mm. kind of been is 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 outside nowhere near the limelight and all the rest of yeah it. So, that's true you know maybe being there doesn't necessarily change that no maybe, maybe not i mean i think the, the one thing that the one thing that you can almost taste and remember are the, are the victories you know through, i don't know if, i wonder yeah. i'd be interested to know if that's the same for the Australian teams that I played against because 
Christ, they run so often. It must have been boring. But <laughs> you know, I can remember. I can sort of smell the uh, the uh, you know the, the, the celebrations in the West Indies after after winning down there. I can you know the, those those things jump out at you and stay with you for a long time. And if there was one, if there's one thing that I miss about playing, really, it's kind of that. Um, I don't really miss much else. But I, I do miss the miss the wins and the, those shared shared times that you have when the euphoria is just out of this world. Um, so for 2005, well, if the guys can remember any of it, sure, it was bloody good. You, <laughs> you said something at the start of the chat about um, about sort of not missing dressing rooms as such, which I suppose informs why you went to the broadcast side as opposed to the, the coaching side, which is often a decision mm. that players need to make when, when their playing career is finished, as yours did in, in 2009. But I, I love something you said on Twitter last week about your passion is for the game and not... Mm having a dog in the fight helps you with that, not f- feeling... I mean, you're a former England player and no one's questioning your patriotism, but when you're working in cricket, your focus is on the game at large, capital G, uh, sort of as yeah. opposed to um, whether, you know, England have a good session or not. Uh, your emotional tie-up now with cricket is about the love of the 22 yards in the middle. Um, and I think that's, Great that's sort of... cricket. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's a, there's a nice way of sort of evaluating that, isn't it, that... All that you went through as a player and all that you've seen as a broadcaster, you've still got that passion that you probably had as a little boy in that Surrey dressing room. Yeah, exactly that. And, and I think I think what I'm doing now allows me to to feel that way about it. <clears throat> One of the things I felt at the end at the end of my playing career was that I was just so I was so um, emotionally involved and caught caught up in. Um, uh, who was winning and who was losing. You know, I was captain of Surrey. We were having a, a, a pretty shocking time towards the back end of the the first decade of the 2000s. Mm. And you just carry that with you. I'd carry that. That would hurt in ways that I, that I didn't want to experience anymore. Um, and it was, I was starting to hate the sport because of it, because it just wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't enjoy feeling as, as sort of culpable or as emotionally tied up in, in, in those wins and losses. It was my identity, I suppose, so Surrey County Cricket Club, and so I perhaps felt it more keenly than, than I might have done if it was another, if I was doing another job somewhere else. Um, and so, so part of part of the the way of the only way really of, of, of being able to stay as in touch and, in, and as in love with the game was by removing myself from the nuts and bolts of who's doing what, who's scoring runs, who's winning, who's losing, and being able to see it as a as a whole. Um, and uh, to enjoy it for what it is, to be able to to be able to enjoy um, the skill and the and the athleticism and stuff of, of this generation of players, to be able to you know to, to be able to position Test match cricket and T Twenty cricket and fifty over cricket in in their in their roles in the grand scheme of things for getting people to to love the sport. Um, and you can't do that if you're playing. Or I don't think you can. Or I wouldn't have been able to put it yeah. that way. I can only speak for myself. Um, but as a broadcaster, you can do all of those things, and and you can cheerlead as well. I mean, but you're cheerleading for the sport. You're not cheerleading for a team. You're cheerleading for the game itself, um, and you know how great it is, and how enjoyable it can be, and how uh, how how much of a of a wonderful thing it is to be involved in at any level, whether you're playing, whether you're you know a supporter, a volunteer, whatever that might be. You know, it's given me an incredible life, and 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 to be able to say to other people that it can do the same for you if you if you're open if you're open enough to it that is a is a is a great gift i think yeah and this stood out to me last year when coming on your debate program that your interest uh intricate interest if you like in, in the nuts and bolts of the workings of the game behind the scene and the the, the strength of the administration and so on that's not mm. something you'd necessarily get from uh, a broadcaster who and this is kind of that um this cliche we almost referred to earlier isn't it the, the former player who talks about how, how they would have done it had they been playing then and doesn't have a broader frame of reference. But the very fact that you're called upon to to host that debate show uh, and to mm. talk about the game far more broadly, uh, it reflects your your interest in, in the health of it, as you say, not just being emotionally wrapped up in wins and losses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, without that, without that sort of broader remit, I wouldn't enjoy it so much anyway, you know. I, I tend to I tend to sort of like have try and try and stick my nose into all all parts, uh, <laughs> perhaps not be as as informed about everything as you possibly can, but trying to know what's going on. You know, having a having a broad outlook in in in, in the game itself, um, 
and and again try try to try to bring people into it but the the, the um the sport needs that. The sport doesn't need people carping and bitching and, and saying how much better they would have done it 30 years ago. Yeah. No sport needs that. No sport has that, I think, to the extent perhaps that cricket does at times. Um, and so, you know, the, the job is to look, look forward a little bit, to, to be impressed by and to, um, and, to, and to marvel at what these guys can do now that they couldn't do before. I mean, I think that's a far more interesting frame of reference than talking about what they can't do now in, in, as opposed to what they could do before. I mean, who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, and, and uh, mate, I have an incredible amount of respect for the sort of the, the history of the game and the, and the feats and the, and the numbers of the players gone by. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, 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 I know all that. I used to know all that as a kid. I used to spend hours with bloody score books and things and looking through. I, I was a complete <laughs> nuffy. That, that got wiped out pretty quick. I don't know what that was. Probably being drinking age. I don't know. But anyway, I, I did all that stuff. I, so I have an enormous, incredible amount of respect for, for the guys who have gone before. But they've gone, as I did, and as as the the next lot will. Um, the game continues, doesn't it? Yeah, the um, the world doesn't stop. It, mm. It's interesting that you know you, you've you've always been pretty politically engaged and not shy about having an opinion um, politically, whereas like a lot of people in sports broadcasting tend to just stay on the fence because they, they don't want to um, say the wrong thing and alienate any part of their audience or, or whatever it might be. Mm. Um, but then, so you already had that. That had, that had been part of your makeup for a while. And then last well, year... Well, I, I, the, I don't know if it had, you know. I, t I don't know if it had. I I, 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 sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but okay. I, I don't think prior to probably prior to 2016 i don't think i'd ever really kind of been well I certainly wasn't out in terms of sort of any any political leaning and i don't think i was ever really that bothered but i kind of it's a, it's a little bit like you, you know you, you spy on injustice it doesn't matter who you're working for or or whether or not it might it might impact you negatively down the line you just say what what you think is happening that's all yeah. um and I, I would never, I would, I would absolutely, um, I would shrivel at the idea that I was ever sort of pol politically engaged before because I wasn't. I just didn't mm. care. I was like, like most most other sports people, no, no interest whatsoever. You might look at your uh, your tax, <laughs> at your tax bill at the end of the year, and that might be the sum total of your interest in in terms of yeah. what who politically was making those calls. But yeah. something, you know, things have a lot of things have happened in the last four or five years, and you whereby you just think well how the hell can you possibly sit on the fence hmm. with 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 things like things like the things we've been witnessing in the last four or five years and that's you know sometimes i think to myself for god's sake just leave it alone but you know hmm. hope for, i'll leave it maybe maybe we should all leave it alone when things are things are less crappy you know hmm. yeah. <laughs> seems reasonable that'd be nice that, that, that's probably what i'm thinking about really is since 2016 you know the last five years or so um i'm thinking about your online presence more than mm. anything and so yeah, yeah okay. you know that's that's probably the the starting point sure um, but it was notable last year that when when the black lives matter uh, mm. movement started becoming more of a thing in in britain and more of a thing in cricket um that, that you know you you had a prominent place uh, to a prominent part to play in that your mother was jamaican um mm -hmm. you, and and that you know didn't necessarily feel like it had been a huge part of your story publicly before but you were happy to step into that um you know into the interview the arena once yeah. that once once people needed to talk about that um or once, yeah. once the pressure was on to talk about it yeah i guess so i mean i guess it's, it's kind of like well I, I i could i could sort of just just allow you know my, my life's pretty good I, I don't i haven't really been adversely affected by by the fact that that I'm, I'm mixed race, um, my my mum is an incredible human. You know, being being sort of a, a black Jamaican married to a, a white English boy back in the seventies was not straightforward. But she and my dad always kind of sort of were able to kind of take care of us from you know shield us from the worst of, of that when we were growing up. Um, and so, you know, my my, exp my experience is is genu genuinely um, a positive one. I, I, I'm incredibly proud of my my um, Jamaican heritage. 
and it's never it hasn't really caused me any problems um but i know that that is not the case for for many other people um and so if um if because because i'm able to sort of uh either articulate or just because i have the platform from time to time of being um on on the tv and i'm asked about it then i won't shy away from it um you can't i don't I think one of the things that i find extraordinary actually is that that people find it so difficult to kind of put themselves in this to other people's experiences and think that just because i haven't uh, just because i haven't had this thing happen to me or just because i've never seen it that it, it doesn't exist um and it's bizarre it seems incredible to me that, that people can have that 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 point of view whereby if i haven't seen it it hasn't happened type thing um or if i you know if i didn't know what i was looking for it hasn't happened it doesn't kind of you know and so it's i think it's important to kind of to be able to to listen um to to people's experiences and perhaps put put two and two together you're not always going to be presented with the the fate the complete the, oh here it is i'm like oh i can see it now um a certain amount of reading between the lines is necessary every once in a while yeah sort of almost like acknowledging your privileged there i use that, that yep. loaded term position in society having been a former professional athlete and having that yep. that platform that you're perhaps less likely to um experience the worst of it and i think that was a theme of a, a lot of cricketers last year when the black lives matter conversation was at its peak if you like and certainly the 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 vodcast which you're involved in uh hosting uh, that sky cricket put out and the i would call it activism that sky cricket did in, in a really positive mm. way uh, around that yeah. first test match at the EGS bowl i mean it was a it was you could have shouldered arms to that had you seen fit to do so, but there weren't many people shouldering arms. So I think most people were able to acknowledge that yes, whilst they might sit in a slightly more privileged position, they, they weren't able to let this one go by. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I think the whole production was would and sh uh, was and, and should be very proud of what they did that yeah. day, and subsequently as well. Um, you know, it's one of those things that people kind of you, you can sense fatigue with people on, on these things, but I think it's incredibly important that that we don't you know i you know we're, i'm old enough to remember rodney king and the riots in mm. los angeles in the 90s and stuff and the kind of you know there was a reaction then but it disappears and it happens again and there's a reaction and it disappears um you know the the finals the, the last straw for me perhaps on on all of that was it, a guy got killed in broad daylight in broad daylight with witnesses all over the place now if you if you're telling me that there isn't some kind of some kind of idea that i can behave with impunity with this human being because because he's black and i'm white um then then you're blind you know you, the fact that, that they felt that they were able to snuff this guy out in full view of everybody in broad daylight being videoed etc etc knowing that they were probably going to get away with it is as big a is as big a um you know as as big a banner as you can ever have and and mm. and so and therefore you know lots of people lots of people were unbelievably shocked unbelievably sort of outraged and quite right too um and if it's made uh, you know various people uncomfortable then so be it it's not as uncomfortable as being strangled to death in broad daylight so you just have to put up with it mm. and and that you know what what this is showing you isn't like this was some new outrage it's the impunity that security forces and police forces have in just about every country um that's the way they're set up there is no accountability that's mm. that's part of the deal um for for the way those forces work yeah but and and, and again you know it, it's less about the less about the sort of like the, the the police it's just it's just about the complete and utter disregard for the right of that person hmm. to be treated normally you know you, people get apprehended every single day every single day um not like that they don't hmm. not so that it ends it ends with them dying on the street in broad daylight in front of God knows how many witnesses and all of his mates. This wasn't some one-on-one -on -one down an alleyway. You know, that's a, just, I don't know, but I just think you have to stop and think about that for a little while. 
and think what that what that means, what that's telling you. Um, you know, I went on a I went on one of the sort of it wasn't a march really. We sort of sat in a park, my my hometown, and listened to some incredibly eloquent and incredibly um, bright young black Asian um, people from my hometown. Peaceful, everybody socially distanced, everybody wearing masks, but it was great. It was a really like I'd never done a thing like that before, and I'm really proud, proud that I did, or pleased that I did, not proud. Um, and you know, the, the the younger the younger generation seem to be completely all over all of this sort of stuff, and have, have, have realised or understood or just can't understand why things wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't be different from the way they are now. And so you know, who knows. 15 years time 20 years time we, we we might have to talk about this less or not at all yeah let's hope so and i suppose between times you don't just have the the microphone as a commentator <laughs> and your social media um, platforms to talk you've also got your art and, and your music and uh, mm. you know, you're still creating you've still got that that inspiration that's fueling uh you making a lot of music yeah absolutely yeah so i, I think we're about a month or so away from releasing another four four tracks on an, on an EP with a view of putting out an album in the, in November, October, November. So yeah, yeah, the writing is good. I mean, that, that's one of the incredible things about this, about being in lockdown and all the other kind of stuff. That, that, that there's not much else to do, but sort of be creative. Obviously look after the little ones and whatever. And when you get five minutes, disappear off to the shed and go and, and go and write, you know, read, write, it's all good. We might let you get back to doing uh, just that. Nice place to leave it. Uh, Mark Butcher, you've been just a fantastic guest. Uh, thanks for sharing so many of your experiences in a remarkable life in cricket. And may they continue for many decades to come. Cheers, gents. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>